Hello friends. In this video you will see a manhwa called The Princess in the Attic. Please put a like and subscribe if you like this video. Thank you. Let's get started. In a tall, gloomy tower, more like a dungeon, sat a girl. She shouted childishly to the maids that she didn't want anything and threw a saucer at them. The saucer missed the girls and shattered on the floor with a clang. They shouted at the prisoner that she had gone mad but she replied that she would not eat anything. The broken plate spewed soup all over the stone tiles. The prisoner demanded sweets and shouted it frantically, making the servant's ears ache. Then the girl attacked one of the maids and bit her leg. They began to demand the prisoner, calling her a witch, to get away from them immediately. The eldest of the maids threw a loaf of stale bread on the floor. The girl, who was like a small child in mind, began to enjoy the bread and said that she liked it, and then began to eat it greedily. The maid said that she was going to vomit and could not stay in the place any longer, as the prisoner's body gave off a disgusting odor. As they left, the girls asked each other when they could stop caring for this girl. After all, she couldn't even be killed because of the curse. The door locked, and hearing the silence, the prisoner plumped down on the bed in relief. She was sick of living every day like this. The Holy Empire of Trump was a theocratic state that periodically gave birth to men chosen by the gods. Men chosen by the gods are those who were sent by the Almighty to prove the promise made to the first emperor by the gods who loved him for his profound righteousness. They are born with disposition, they have God's pattern on their body. And together with his appearance they go to the temple. After that, in the temple they pray for the peace of the empire and make a sacrifice. As payment, however, they receive a guarantee of wealth and honor in ordinary life. The gods rejoice at the sacrifice of their chosen person, and because of this, no country dared to even envy the mighty holy empire. It was like this 20 years ago, but at some point the rain stopped pouring over the empire. The dried up rivers and lakes, the continued crop failure, the disappearance of animal and plant species, the future infectious diseases. The empire, which had been abundant and beautiful, fell into chaos in an instant. But people believed that the oracle was wrong, and all the blame was on the despicable nomadic woman who brought misfortune. After all, she had dared to spend the night with the emperor and have even more dirty greedy thoughts. It was decided to find the source of the misfortune and get rid of it. Because of the archbishop's words, the people of the empire became angry. As expected, the emperor began to lament the nomad. He ordered her to be found and executed. So one night by the light of a bright moon, the nomadess ran with all her legs to save herself. She clutched the infant to her weakened body, moving through the forest all night long. But in the end, she was led to the scaffold anyway. People were screaming that she should be killed along with the baby. That's when the nomadess pronounced the curse. She said that this curse would haunt them even after her death. If the blood of her innocent child sprinkled on this land, the sacred empire would be destroyed. Drought would continue, disease would overtake them, and everyone here would die. As a result, the mother's desperate curse saved the child, and her father, the emperor, locked his little girl in the damp attic. Following the instructions of the temple, a lock was hung to seal the cursed blood. But even after that, the drought continued, and the man chosen by the gods did not appear. The Trump empire will never be rich again. After all, that God's chosen one they were so diligently searching for was right under their noses and locked in the attic by them. She managed to take a bite of the bread, but it was so stale and old that she did not think she could finish it. Then she summoned the water spirit that lived in the seal on her hand, a symbol hidden on her skin that only appeared when she wanted it to. A blue glow poured from the pattern on her skin, and a disembodied voice asked the mistress if she had called him. The red-haired girl answered the spirit that she needed to wet her throat and called it Ave. Aqua replied that she could create as much water as the mistress desired. The girl herself was named Osiria. During her imprisonment, which began when she was still an infant, Osiria had gained a lot from Aqua. Having watched the scene of her mother's execution many times in her visions, Osiria waited for the moment when the empire would be driven to a dead end. Some water appeared in the girl's palms and she said that she found it amazing every time. Then she thanked Aqua and quenched her thirst. The drought of the empire had become terrifying. Pretty soon, they would be willing to do anything to find a source of water. In a situation like this, Osiria, who was a princess, would be the most useful sacrifice. She had been carefully pretending to be insane all this time, so it was likely that they would think that she could be easily used. She longed for the empire to dry up as soon as possible, and then this drought would be a precious current for her. Osiria was asleep, and in her dream she saw her bound mother being whipped and then the blade of the guillotine being raised above her. The girl herself stands among the crowd and sees everything from the outside. She hears her mother, with her bloody mouth telling her Osiria, beautiful and unfortunate, 
my beloved child afterward she coughed. Her daughter looked at her amidst the black space with terror in her eyes, and then woke up abruptly from the nightmare. The girl was very much frightened. She took a breath, leaned against the wall, and covering her face with her hands thought about the fact that she had this dream every time she started to forget about it. For the sake of protecting her child, her mother had taken on her sins without question. She spent her last desperate moment in the mad jubilation of the entire empire standing before her eyes. Even after watching this scene an infinite number of times, it seemed sad to Assyria again and again. It was unbearable for her. On the same day, a group of advisors arrived at Emperor Solus and informed him that he needed to immediately make some decision regarding the situation in the empire. The Trump empire had not seen a drop of rain for three years now, and the population had shrunk by a quarter. We must seize the water source by any means necessary. The emperor rested his head tiredly on his palm and thought about the fact that the previous prayer recited in the temple had not helped them at all and had not caused a drop of rain. One of the advisors asked the emperor what he thought about sending Princess Osiria back to the kingdom of Jardine. If they made a treaty, they could import water from the kingdom for an extended period of time. The emperor replied that it hurt his pride. Should he, the emperor of the country, bow his head to some kingdom? The counselor said that the archbishop also spoke in favor of the proposal. Besides, once they managed to fix the water issue, they could increase their military power and easily restore the status of the empire. Emperor Solus, who considered the archbishop's opinion to be important, replied that since he was in favor, he thought that there should be no problem in this plan and agreed. He realized that indeed, if one bows just once, they will be able to get water at a cheap price for a long time. It would be a chance to get rid of their main headache for a long time. Together with the council, they discussed that everything would only succeed if they successfully resolved the issue, everything would turn out in their favor. So far they had left the princess alive because of the nomad curse and couldn't just abandon her for fear she would die somewhere outside their territories. The emperor told his advisors that his unwanted daughter's intelligence remained at the level of a small child. In what capacity could they send something half abnormal to their neighbors? The men replied that they would train her so that she would keep quiet as much as possible, could educate her so that words would not come out of her mouth out of place, and she would be humble. Although she was the seed of evil, the princess was like her mother and always looked displeased, but if they trained her properly in bedroom affairs, she could be a concubine. The emperor sighed and thought about how he wished he could go back 20 years to the moment he had embraced the nomadic woman to change his future destiny and the fate of his state. Aloud, he told his advisors to make arrangements with the kingdom of Jardine and train the princess so that she would be of as much use as possible, and then sternly ordered that they should also speed up the search for the man chosen by the gods. They must contact the temple and order them not to interrupt their prayers. The last instruction was to raise the tax the harvest must be gathered and the best of it given as a sacrifice. Osiria, sitting on her bed, heard suspicious sounds outside the door. It was too early for the maids to visit, she had never been visited at this hour, so what was wrong? The maids opened the door and grabbed the prisoner by the arms. Osiria didn't understand what was happening and thought they had come up with some new way to abuse her. She begged them to let her go, but one of the maids slapped her and told her that if she didn't want to be beaten, she should obediently follow them. As she descended the stairs, the girl kicked and demanded to be let go. There were red symbols everywhere on the walls, they were frightening in their appearance, a reminder that the girl was a cursed person. Osiria was in a lot of pain, the maids were squeezing her. The maids complained that the girl was bothering them, and the eldest, walking behind, asked them to bear it a little longer, confident that very soon it would rain over their land and they would be rid of this burden. Osiria answered her in her mind that they would not see any rain, not even the uncleanness of the sky. The maids asked the older woman if everything would be all right, given that the princess could hear their dialogue. The woman replied that it didn't make any difference because this girl didn't understand anything anyway. The girl thought to herself that she understood everything, and the maids were very stupid. As she walked down the corridor, Osiria squinted, and when she opened her eyes she saw a huge window in front of her, it was the first time she had ever seen the sky, and she noticed that it was much different from the illusions Aqua had shown her. She didn't know where they were taking her, but she thought about the fact that the fact that she had come out of the attic meant that her father, the Emperor, had found a way to throw her out. Perhaps she would finally get her chance for revenge. The maids opened the doors of the Great Hall and told the princess to go inside. They then abruptly removed Osiria's clothes and doused her with water. She asked them not to squeeze her hand, it hurt too much, but they doused her with water once more in response. Water got into her mouth and nose and she began to cough. The maids thought she was coughing because she was full of contagion and disease and lowered her into the tub with open squeamishness. 
The water instantly turned black. The maids were shocked at how filthy the girl was and how the room was filled with stench. They called her a garbage can, not a person. Osiria blushed, gritted her teeth, and thought to herself, after all, they themselves had at best poured a bucket of water on her once a year and wiped her down with rags, and now they were complaining about the filth. When she was finally clean, she was dressed in a dress, her hair was styled, and she was brought to the headmaid. She greeted the princess and said that she was a little nicer to be around after her bath. Afterwards, she introduced herself as Arena and said that from today she would be in charge of her education. The princess didn't understand what she was going to be taught and only said a short U sound in response. Arena swung around and slapped the girl, saying that the girl froze from the mere slap, which meant that she had been living happily enough until now. Arena demanded to listen to her carefully from now on. The princess is not allowed to make such sounds, and His Majesty the Emperor had personally given her orders to train his daughter, so if she disobeyed, she would receive punishments. Osiris said you again, and Arena, slapping her on the other cheek, demanded that she answer her yes and not you. The girl fell to the floor and said the word yes three times, hearing back that she was dumbfounded. Arena ordered the maids to put the princess on the bed. She thought she was about to die of pain and obediently lay down herself. Arena approached her and told her that now she should listen carefully and memorize everything that the teacher would tell her. Then she added that by doing so she, useless and worthless, would at least become useful in some way. When she goes to the kingdom she will have to put everything she has learned into practice and obey unquestioningly. Since the princess is stupid, Arena decided to teach her the simplest thing, and after these words sharply grabbed her leg. Osiria, afraid of new pain and not realizing what was happening, kicked Arena with her free leg and screamed that she didn't want to do that. The woman got angry and beat the girl, making her nose bleed. Afterwards, Arena said that the training would last until the princess followed her instructions perfectly. The princess said yes, but in her mind she promised herself that when she started her revenge plan, she would kill Arena first. As night fell, the princess thought about the fact that she had gotten a spacious room with windows, nice and comfortable clothes, and fresh food, but she didn't feel happy about it. She knew she was being prepared like an animal for slaughter or sale. Was she really going to be shipped off as a toy for the aristocrats? But wouldn't that hurt the emperor's pride? No matter how lazy they are about it, they can't get rid of the princess like that. So it's safe to assume that she'll probably be sold to another country. She lasted 20 years in a cramped attic, and compared to that, all of this is nothing. Osiria summoned Aqua and noticed that the light around the spirit was much brighter. Aqua replied that it was a little easier for her to use her power here, the interference from before was gone. The girl said that if you think about it that way, when Aqua appeared in the attic, there were strange patterns everywhere, perhaps they were what was holding back her power. Aqua was a water spirit that had been by Osiria's side since she was a young child. She said she was born to fulfill the girl's wishes and protect her, as she was the chosen one. Now Aqua noticed that her mistress had new wounds. The princess replied that everything was fine, nothing serious, and asked the spirit if she could tell her what had happened. Aqua told the unaware Osiria about many things about this country and her situation, her dead mother and how she met her death, and about revenge. Aqua said that the emperor and his advisors were going to send the princess to the kingdom of Jardine as a concubine, agreeing to import water and food cheaply in return. Convinced that she was going to be sold after all, Osiria asked, what was this kingdom of Zardin? Aqua created an illusion in the air in the form of a picture and told her that what she was seeing in front of her was the water kingdom of Jardine, or rather its capital. The country looked prosperous and happy. Osiria said that although Jardine seemed like a nice place, the people there were as disgusting as anywhere else, because she was being sent there as a slave, of that she was deeply convinced. Aqua asked if she should kill that maid tomorrow as soon as she entered the room. The princess answered that it should not be done yet, because the most important thing is to fulfill the planned revenge, and while she is in these walls, it is not worth making unnecessary noise. Aqua agreed that the best thing to do now was to wait for the moment when the Trump Empire would let go of God's hand on its own the boundless sky and a multitude of mountains. This beautiful view seemed to overwhelm the observer, but it was of little interest to the princess right now. She hadn't realized that the move would amount to a whole month. She was nauseous, but the motion sickness in the carriage was much better than the ship she had traveled on for so long. It was also all better than the disgusting training she had endured. Every day she washed her body and put on luxurious clothes and was subjected to excruciating beatings. They were breaking her as a person, and for the first time inside the storm of fear and shame, she thought about wanting to end it all, but still managed to survive. On the way, Osiria pondered that if she left the empire on her own, a new chosen one would probably be born in her territory. 
It would appear as if she would be giving the Empire a chance for rebirth with her own hands. She was determined that such a thing should never happen. She must be rewarded for her torment, and to do so it was not she who must surrender, but the Empire. She wished to destroy an Empire that had forgotten its sanctity. Osiria became violently nauseous and Aqua asked her if her mistress wanted her to kill everyone right on the spot, since they made her feel so bad. The girl told Aqua not to ask her that again the spirit had asked her periodically throughout the trip, which made the princess tired of hearing the question. Of course she wanted to kill them all on the spot, but she had to be patient a little longer. A complete break with the Empire was only the beginning. Osiria planned to develop overwhelming power and make it rain sprinkles all over the world. She would close the skies with downpours that were supposed to be raining in the Empire, in other countries. And with her own hands, she would complete it all. Suddenly, she saw in the horse carriage that they were already approaching the main castle of the Kingdom of Jardine. Aqua replied that very soon the mistress would be free. This place was beautiful. The Trump Empire was beautiful too, but Osiria couldn't see it as such. Knowing how much pain she went through in that place, it was a living hell for her. When they arrived at the place, the princess escorted to the castle, she thought about the fact that hostages were usually given to the king and wondered if she was also planned to be handed over to the king of this country. It would be best to fall into the hands of someone she wouldn't have to see. Because of the people in front, Osiria couldn't see the king. Irina yanked her from behind as she tried to stretch out and look and told the princess to stand still. Barely crying, the girl thought of the teacher acting like this until the very end. The king told the representatives of the Trump Empire that they had come a long way and suggested that they start by sitting down, but there were no chairs around. The counselors whispered amongst themselves and one of them said he would probably be rude, but still asked the king where they should sit. The king replied that the answer to the question was obvious and pointed his finger to the floor. Then he asked, wouldn't it be enough to sit right where they were standing? The advisors asked the king, does he not put the emperor's delegation on anything? The one sitting on the throne replied that he did not, and in his opinion there was nothing to humiliate them. Such was the greeting used only in their country. He then asked the delegation if they respected the traditions of the Jardine Kingdom. The delegation was stumped, and the counselor had to reply that they respected the traditions, accepted the king's friendly offer, and apologized. Osiria, sitting down on the floor with the others, thought about the fact that they were real idiots. After all, it was long past time to realize that the empire would no longer be as respected as it used to be. Suddenly, the king asked Princess Osiria to step forward. She stood up and took a few steps forward. The king told the delegation that the empire's status has fallen greatly. But even if they have water problems, is it too much to send the princess as a concubine? Even though she's half out of her mind. The princess thought to herself that it would be better to pretend to be even more stupid than usual and once again said the U sound that Arena had been so diligent in weaning her off of. The girl thought that if the king saw how stupid she was, he would lose all interest in her. Arena stepped forward and said that she understood the king's excitement but despite her ailment, the princess was better than any woman in the empire. She was a bit dumbed down because of the one incident but she was still a quick learner and they had trained her so that she would in no way cause any inconvenience. Osiria stood there with a downcast look and thought about how every word Arena said was nonsense. Surely they couldn't say that she had actually gone mad because she had stayed locked up since she was a child. The ambassador said that because of long-standing trade relations, His Majesty the Emperor said he was giving the precious princess to the Jardine King as a friendly gesture, so they would be grateful if he would accept her without too much worry. The king was silent, then began to ponder this friendly gesture. Osiria tensed at the king's dull response. Did he not like her? She decided that was not the case and she owed it to him to like her. She raised her head and met the king's gaze. She was immediately flustered, her heart began to pound faster. The king's gaze was piercing and sharp, as if he knew absolutely everything about her. She immediately lowered her gaze and noticed that the symbol on her hand began to glow. She suspected that the king could see it, but after all other people cannot see these patterns. The king asked the princess to raise her head and look at him. Osiria thought that this was the first person she had ever felt so much anxiety about except, was he definitely human? Osiria feared she had rushed too fast and done something wrong. She felt as if the king was skinning her with a mere glance. Irina approached the princess and asked her to raise her head as the king had instructed her to do, and added that she should do as she had been trained. Osiria clenched her hands on her dress and thought about the fact that this woman had taught her nothing but to answer men with the word yes. She looked at the king and decided to continue acting as she had before. The king smirked and asked the ambassadors if they needed supplies of water and food. 
one of the emperor's advisors replied that they were requesting an exchange as a sign of friendship between the two countries. The king replied that he did not understand why the princess had been sent to him. Does Trump's emperor really lead a licentious lifestyle? The ambassadors were outraged and asked the king how could he say such a thing. Osiria felt as if the king's words were aimed at her. It was as if he meant that without her, the problems of the empire would be solved. The king said that he liked everything in principle and asked the delegation to tell the emperor that he would receive the princess with gratitude. Then he immediately occupied himself with the question of what to do with her. He summoned to him a knight Sir Fidelius. The young man in armor approached the king and bowed to him on one knee. The king told the knight that from now on he would look after Princess Osiria, as there was no room for her in his royal castle. The delegation got excited, the princess along with him. Even she realized that it was nonsense, and every time the king opened his mouth a lie sounded. Did it make sense that in the entire spacious castle there was no place for the princess to stay? Sir Fidelius replied to his majesty that he was too inconsiderate, causing him to not understand the meaning of his order. King Jardine replied that it was his gift to a knight who refused all honors bestowed upon him. Osiria thought that things were going well enough, for in any case, the king had no intention of sending her back to the empire. It was also obvious why he was acting this way right here and now. He could have given this order later, but he wanted the empire's delegation to see him hand over the king's gift to some knight, showing that the value of the princess and the empire itself was insignificant. He was breaking the pride of the empire and put them in their place. The advisors immediately began to whisper among themselves that it was the height of tactlessness to hand over the princess right in front of their eyes. Osiria heard them saying that because it didn't rain in their country, they had to endure such treatment because of that damned girl. The princess, looking down at the floor, thought about the fact that not so long ago they were putting all the blame on the powerless nomad. And after her death, the arrows of all sins were aimed at her daughter. Osiria decided they could talk all they wanted, for she had already determined their end. The king asked the knight Fidelius if he would accept the gift this time, and then added that it was his show of concern he wanted his subordinate to finally become interested in girls. Fidelius replied that he was obeying the king's orders. His majesty said that he was glad that the knight had accepted the gift and promised that he would be satisfied. The king then turned to the delegation and explained that he had decided that the princess would be a perfect match for his sword, that is, the head knight, and asked them not to be upset. Osiria thought that since the king had gotten the knight interested in someone like her, it was likely that he hated the subaltern. Suddenly, the king looked at the princess and asked the delegation, would it be better if they confined themselves to the box given by the emperor and send the princess back? The princess was very much frightened and thought that the king obviously liked to play with people. But that shouldn't happen because the empire wouldn't like taking her back either. But what if they did so because of hurt pride? One of the representatives of the delegation replied to the king that the princess was given as a token of friendship so the king was free to dispose of her in the future. The king smiled, thanked for his understanding, and announced a banquet for the guests to enjoy before leaving. The delegation left and only Osiria was left sitting on the floor. She didn't know what she should do should she get up and move away somewhere. But she finally felt free. The empire had abandoned her, and she was able to break the shackles that were strangling her. With that, the Trump empire had finally lost its divine power. The king told Knight Fidelius to pick up the princess and escort her to his home. He was also free for the day, and may not return to the palace. The knight replied that he obeyed and rose from his knee. Osiria only now remembered him, and even thought of summoning Aqua, but immediately changed her mind, deciding that she could not hurry, for if she exposed herself she would be captured. Fidelius leaned over the princess, and touching her, asked if she could stand up on her own. Fidelius startled the girl and her heart beat fast. She was confused, and didn't know what to say to him. It was very unusual for someone to address her with such respect. Without getting an answer, the knight apologized and then lifted the princess in his arms. Afterwards, he said goodbye to the king and went to the exit. The girl was amazed how he could calmly walk with her in his arms right in front of the king. She was so much surprised that she almost screamed. From behind Fidelia's shoulder, she took one last look at the king. After looking at his mysterious appearance, she decided that once she got out of here, she would have to find out more about his majesty. She was sure he had many secrets and Aqua would know something about it. Suddenly she heard the king with a smile quietly asking if she got what she wanted. Osiria thought she had misheard, that he hadn't actually said anything. But the anxiety inside grew stronger, and her subconscious assured her that he knew everything and had deliberately asked her about it. He knew she was sane and wanted to stay in the kingdom herself. He made no sound, just moved his lips but he read her through it. 
the kingdom of Jardine was a country that had received the blessing of water. Accordingly, the king of the water country could still see Aqua's hidden pattern on her hand. His eye color, a blue that had a glow from within, resembled the light that Aqua emitted. Their gazes met for only a moment, but a shiver still ran through her body. Her mind was filled with thoughts of killing the king, finding a way to do it, since the effective way to survive in her case was to kill her opponents. However, she realized that she wouldn't be able to do that. She's in the territory of the king who also commands water. The advantage is on his side. Fidelia squeezed the princess tighter, feeling her trembling, and stared in front of him the whole way without looking at her. She wondered if this man was going to be alright. Despite having to carry a crazy girl in his arms, it didn't seem like he was angry. Osiria closed her eyes and pressed herself against the cold lats of Fidelius. It was the first time she had ever been hugged by someone, it was nice to feel that, something that other people had much more access to. They went outside and the knight put the princess in the carriage. He then asked the princess if she had felt any discomfort on the way here. Osiria tensed up again as the knight addressed her as her highness, and that was too polite for her. In her entire life she had never heard such a thing in the empire and responded to the knight to leave because she didn't like him. In response, the knight on the contrary approached and asked with an innocent look, didn't the princess like him? Osiria did not understand him. She thought that after her answer he would get angry and beat her up like he always did in the empire but he remained calm. It was strange since she was the perfect punching bag, but why was he treating her with such respect? She felt disgusted by this and abruptly shouted that she wanted to go home. She tried to push Fidelius away and drummed her fists on her legs. She deliberately wanted to make him angry, and then she squeezed her eyes shut, expecting a blow. But the knight only gently touched her hand with his palm. He asked her not to move so abruptly because the seat was hard and she might hit herself. Then he took her palm in his two hands and said that it was probably hard for her to get here. So they would hurry up and head to the house first. In her thoughts, Osiria answered him that there was no way she would fall for his silly acting and false kindness. She was confident in her ability to pretend and continued to pretend not to understand his words. To herself, she told herself that there was no way she should ever get lost and believe people, and the farther she went, the better she needed to hide her true appearance. She responded to Fidelia's handshake and replied with a smile that she was glad to go home. The young man was pleasantly surprised to hear this. Osiria told herself that there was no way she would believe someone's good-naturedness, but one must accept it to avoid revealing her intentions, so she would play the foolish child who had been ignored for a long time. All along the way, Osiria kept thinking about the fact that there are no wholly good people in this world. There are only people with good and bad patience. She looked at Fidelia as he was sitting across from her with his eyes closed, as if dozing. This man seems to have good patience, so most likely if he's not annoyed he won't hit her that was the princess's reasoning. But she still had to be careful, because Aqua had told her earlier that calm and quiet people were the most frightening in anger. Osiria felt nauseous again. Fidelius opened his eyes and noticed that the girl wasn't feeling well. He asked if she was alright, since she looked like she was getting motion sickness. She replied with a faint you sound. Fidelius stood up, approached the princess, and apologized to her in advance before touching her back with his hand and loosening the ties of her corset. When the vise of the dress loosened, she was able to breathe more air, and literally glowed with relief. Fidelius said that she felt ill because of the tightness of the dress, and asked the girl to lean against the side of the carriage to make it easier. He then took her hands and pressed his thumb between her thumb and forefinger. She cried out that it hurt, but Fidelius calmly replied that it wasn't pain. The knight said that it seemed the princess was still seasick and suggested that she walk further. Osiria thought the man was a fool for trying to talk to someone who was completely speechless. Until now, no man had ever asked her anything. After all, taking an interest in the opinion of an interlocutor who was impossible to talk to was just a waste of time. Fidelius didn't seem stupid enough not to realize that. In that case, maybe he decided to test the princess and suspected her of something? She questioned him and he replied that it wasn't that long of a walk from here so they would be able to get there on their own. She replied that she would walk. She was quite glad to get out of the carriage as soon as possible. Fidelius handed the princess over to the maid, who chattered away, showing her around the mansion. As she escorted her to her room, she apologized for not being able to be with her longer now, as she had other things to finish urgently. But if she had the chance, she would like to talk to her longer, so she asked if the princess would mind if she did it later. Hearing no answer, the girl added that if the princess needed anything, she could ring the bell and then the servants would come to her and fulfill everything. Walking away around the corner, the girl finally met her eyes with her new mistress, and with a wide smile told her that she would be back to see her soon. As she walked away, Osiria thought to herself that for this child, 
The maid was quite young, she had a headache. She remembered that Aqua had once told her that humans socialize with people who are similar to them. Even if that was true, there was no way she thought the servants in this place would turn out to be so kind. She was sure that as time passed, each of them would show their true selves. Osiria summoned Aqua, and was surprised that this time there was such a bright light emanating from her as there had never been before. The spirit asked if her mistress had called for her and turned around as a small palm-sized mermaid. Her skin, hair, and tail scales were blue in color. She looked like both a boy and a girl at the same time, her hair was short and her upper body was uncovered. Osiria was very frightened and asked the water spirit if it was really Aqua. The little girl answered that on her arrival in the water country she had been overwhelmed by the energy of the place, and was finally able to show her true colors, which for so many years she had lacked the strength to do, and all she could do was show her light. The princess thought Aqua was a boy though she was always sure from her voice that she was a girl. The joyful mermaid replied that she had no gender and could be addressed in any gender. Osiria couldn't take her eyes off the spirit and thought about how cute Aqua was. The mermaid asked her mistress if she felt her connection to the Trump Empire had finally been severed. The princess replied that she had felt it. She had no idea that she would be so happy about the feeling of freedom, now all she had to do was get out of this house. Aqua asked her mistress why she was going to leave. Osiria replied that she had been sold to this country and so she couldn't be free. Aqua said that if that was the problem she could personally speak to King Jardine about it. The princess asked her little helper if she really knew the king. She then added that she thought she thought he saw the hidden pattern on her hand and exposed her child's play. Would it be dangerous for Aqua to talk to him? Aqua became nervous and replied that she assumed it would be okay. Osiria immediately realized that Aqua knew much more than she did and was purposely avoiding answering her questions, even though she had always answered her clearly before. Getting angry, the princess said that no matter how it was, she didn't want to ask anything from the king. She considered him suspicious. Aqua sank down and said sadly that since it was what her mistress wanted, she would follow her will. But asked her to believe that the kingdom of Jardine was the best place to stay. Besides, there was a positive energy coming from this night. Aqua didn't feel he was bad and dangerous towards the mistress. Osiria replied that she knew that herself, which made it even more uncomfortable for her to be here. It would be better if he treated her carelessly, and then it would be easier to get away from him there would be a message, less pressure on her conscience and guilt before him for not being able to repay him for his care. Suddenly, Aqua hugged her mistress by the hair and said that she felt that now she could not pretend to anyone and be herself. She had sacrificed a lot up until now, and so Aqua wanted the princess to now live the life she wanted to live, without deceiving anyone, in peace and happiness, surrounded by affection and care. After all, the mistress had been loved by God since birth. Osiria thought these words were warm and pleasant, it felt like soft feathers enveloping her heart. She replied that she wished she could live the way Aqua said, but the image of her dying mother bleeding to death appeared sharply in front of her eyes. Even though she wanted to forget about revenge, the visions wouldn't let her do so. Once again, the dead mother had said lastly that Osiria was her unfortunate, yet beautiful child. The girl clenched her lips and fists to restrain herself from screaming and crying. Afterward, she said that she didn't need anything in this world except Aqua by her side. Dream-like conversations remain only a dream. And Osiria has an important task left to fulfill. They agreed with Aqua that the girl will stay in this house for a while, and it is better to continue acting like a small child. The princess replied that otherwise the people in this house who were aware of her ailment beforehand would be confused if a useless thing like her suddenly became drastically grown up. Aqua began to think hard and said that people were too complicated for her to understand. This answer was surprising to Osiria, for she had thought that Aqua was much more human-like than she was. Straining her brain, the little mermaid asked that it turns out that if a person with childlike behavior abrupt abruptly became an adult, would that be considered strange? The princess replied that it was. Aqua hugged her and shouted that it was very simple then she just needed to grow up like Aqua herself had just done. Hearing her, Osiria thought that just as she had once, at the expense of Aqua's power, looked at the world and learned one thing at a time, should she do the same now consistently evolve in front of others? She said that although it would take some time, it wasn't a bad way to do it. About to return to the original topic of conversation, Osiria asked Aqua if she would tell her more about the Jardine Kingdom. The mermaid was startled and panicked, not knowing what to say. At that moment someone started approaching the room and calling out to the princess. She used magic that brought Aqua back into the pattern on her arm, and she was just in time for the doors had already been swung open by the maid. Osiria was afraid of being overheard, for she had forgotten where she was and was talking too loudly. 
but it was all right and the maid did not say anything about it. She embraced her mistress and apologized for having to wait for her. The princess was surprised every time by the warmth, light, and tenderness of the girl's face. She thought that most likely this girl had been raised by good people and had never been flogged, so she was as bright as the rays of the sun. The maid, as if explaining to the child, told the princess that she grabbed all the objects in a row, and if after that she put them in her mouth it would be bad and she could get sick. So she began to wipe them with a wet handkerchief. Playing along with her, the princess repeated the word can't. Not expecting this, the maid hugged Osiria's hand with her palms and praised her. After that she said her name was Mary. Osiria thought did this girl speak so curtly on purpose and was afraid she wouldn't understand her. It seemed ridiculous, and at the same time tense the princess, she didn't want anything to be expected of her. She trembled, and trying to play naturally she repeated Mary's name in syllables slowly and uncertainly. The maid was overjoyed and hugged her mistress tightly. She also added that she would be by her side always. This only made Osiria sad and she thought that she was surrounded by strange people. Sir Fidelius sat at a cup of tea beside an elderly man and discussed the situation with him. He said that it was probably very unexpected to accept the meeting with him, and yet he thanked Mr. Mater very much for it. The man replied that it was the house of Fidelius, to receive an invitation to which it was not so easy. Besides, if he refused, he would miss the opportunity to taste the rare tea in the knight's mansion. Afterward, he asked, did something happen that the illustrious knight couldn't handle, for example? It could be related to the princess of the Trump Empire. Rumors spread quickly, and many of the high society and those living in the king's court were already aware that the princess was under Sir Fidelius' care. The young man thought about how conversations with strangers always made him anxious. However, right now he needed the help of an elder standing almost at the very head of the royal palace. He replied to Mr. Meteor that he had seen for himself the condition the princess was in. The elderly man replied that he had seen it, and compared the princess to a small child. What was most important and what concerned him was how depressed she looked. He suggested that there was a high probability that she had been raised in an inappropriate environment. The man then added that there had been some bad rumors about the princess as of late. Fidelius agreed with that. They had heard during discussions of the princess' arrival as a friendly gesture that she was called cursed in the empire. She is hated by the entire homeland. And the palace claims that the princess is the cause of all disasters. They made the incomprehensible words of the powerless girl a shield. Sir Meteor said that the Trump Empire has always relied only on God, so it just so happened that when they had no one else to blame for their misfortunes, they turned their anger on the princess. Too bad she had to become the sacrificial sheep, completely unaware of anything. The man then said that he had heard that originally the king wanted to refuse to exchange friendly gifts. Fidelius replied that he had. However, he eventually changed his mind, and no one could understand what was in his majesty's mind and what influenced his decision. Although his majesty loved fun, he also cared for his people more than anyone else. But why did he still accept the princess despite that? Fidelius didn't know the answer to that question. He had no way of guessing the reason why he had handed this girl over to him. The king should have known that Fidelius was very bad with people, especially women and small children. He looked up sharply and thought about the fact that the king wanted to see the knight get into a predicament and start laughing because of it. He asked the guest if he knew if there was any chance of the princess returning to her original state. She was frightened even when she simply faced Fidelius with a glance and so he asked Sir Meteor, as he wanted the princess to be able to know at least some words and stop being afraid of him. After all, she would now be living in his house, and it would be very inconvenient if she continued to be afraid of him. Sir Meteor now understood why the young man had called him to visit. The knight replied that since Mr. Meteor was a healer he could most likely know how mentally ill people should be treated. The man replied that Fidelius should try to teach the princess to speak himself. The young man was surprised, but the healer said that it wasn't that difficult. If the princess's development has stopped at the level of a small child simply because of shock or environment, it is impossible to cure her with medicine. But if she heard many different words and sentences and felt a variety of vivid emotions, perhaps she would get better just from everyday life. Fidelius trembled and began to panic at the thought of having to talk to the princess and teach her words, even though he himself was very nervous about talking to people. The only time he opens his mouth all day is when he answers his majesty's questions and gives orders to the knights during training. So how can he teach her to speak? Mr. Mater noticed Fidelius' excitement and thought about the fact that the young man was known for his taciturnity, so this was probably not an easy task for him. Fidelius thought about the fact that he couldn't get into the king's head and was thus convinced even more that he had decided to do so just to embarrass the knight. 
It would have been much easier for him if it had been a matter of sword and not words. He began to think of the princess. She was as thin as a fallen branch and as light as a piece of paper. He had never met such a person in his life. And no matter how much he thought about it, he thought that the task set before him was unattainable. He said aloud that he would rather order Mary and Pedro to do it. He thought the princess would like the two servants much better than himself. Mr. Meter replied to Fidelius that he was free to decide as he wished, but that he must not forget his position. Though the princess was in a terrible condition, she was from another country, and if a conflict should occur between the empire and the kingdom, the knight would be compelled to kill her immediately, for she would become an enemy by her origin. An excessive interest and unnecessary displays of affection would only be poison to her. Fidelius replied that he would remember these words. Mary came to Osiria's room and speaking of herself in the third person, so that the unhappy princess would not forget her name, said that she would bring her food and asked her to wait. Afterward she brought vegetables, but the princess refused to eat them in every way. The maid begged the mistress not to be so fastidious and then went to prepare a bath. Then she asked if the princess needed anything else, but she only felt an incessant headache from so much of Mary's chatter. She felt like she was going crazy and didn't understand, did this maid really want to be called by her name so badly? Mary asked her mistress to close her eyes and began to wash her hair, the princess herself pondering that she could not understand the maid's behavior. While Osiria was enjoying the warm bath, Mary informed her that the princess would have to be visited by her master before she could eat. Osiria was not happy about this. She had hardly ever been left alone since she came here, and she missed Aqua very much, whom she had no way of calling on because of the strangers. Sir Fidelius came into Osiria's room with Mr. Madir. The man greeted the princess and said that he was a simple healer serving in the royal court. The girl repeated the word healer with an innocent look. The meter explained that it was the name of a person who treats people. She nodded in understanding. The doctor then asked the girl to hold out her hand to him briefly. Osiria tensed up, not understanding why he would do that. Suddenly Osiria heard Aqua's voice and looked at her palm the sign wasn't glowing, which meant the mermaid shouldn't be around either. The water spirit explained that, having received a large amount of energy, strengthened her powers and now she could communicate with her mistress mentally, and thus no one would overhear them. She then added that the princess would now be able to practice various water spells, as a person with a god pattern could borrow divine power. These words reassured Osiria, but still she held out her hand hesitantly. Mater looked her over and asked her what she usually ate while living in the empire. The girl replied with a smile that she liked hard bread and sweets and asked him to give them to her. This answer strained Fidelius and then the doctor. The princess could feel the oppressive atmosphere around her and thought that she had obviously said something wrong. When they left, Mary said she would be back soon. The princess called her by name and said good which the maid couldn't resist hugging her mistress, pleased that she was making an effort to speak. But Osiria herself was not glad to be touched once more. Finally everyone had left and the princess could relax. She immediately summoned Akva, and no sooner had she taken the form of a mermaid than her mistress immediately grabbed her with her hands. She demanded to leave the place immediately, because she couldn't stand the presence of annoying people anymore. Aqua asked if she was going to run away all of a sudden. She replied that it wasn't sudden and said that she couldn't get used to these people. Aqua didn't understand because everyone here was kind and helpful. Osiria said she didn't care about that, and she was starting to feel uncomfortable about pretending in front of them, playing the little child they didn't deserve it. She bit her lip and added that there was no time to think about it, and it was better to get out of here as quickly as possible and take all the remaining water away from the empire. She planned to start by draining the rivers and lakes that Aqua kept alive for her life. Then they would go around the villages near the empire, reveal her identity to them, and send rain there on the appointed date. Then rumors of Osiria will spread day by day, and the stalled empire will know about her. Aqua said that there are a lot of guards outside and if she goes out in a hurry, she will be captured for sure. Osiria asked if there was nothing that could be done. Aqua replied that with divine power, one can walk on water. Osiria said that would be too conspicuous, and such a thing would hardly help in escaping. The Little Mermaid said that if there was enough water nearby, it would be possible to teleport through it just jump into the water, and in the next instant be in a different place. But the water source would have to be no smaller than a pond, so a regular bathtub wouldn't do the trick. The last possible method remained wings made of water which could be used to fly across the sky. Osiria asked if such a thing was possible? Aqua replied that there was nothing she couldn't do with water and most of the things she could do, the princess herself could do. Aqua suggested she try it right now. In order to make wings, one would have to imagine as if the arms that came out of her back suddenly began to flutter. 
Osiria was indignant was such a thing easy to imagine? Aqua said that the mistress could fly right now and she was confused. Then the mermaid said that the main thing is that in the next moment the mistress will be free. After all, she had spent her whole life in a dark attic. Osiria opened the window and lifting the skirt of her dress, climbed onto the windowsill. Whether it was wings or something else, she was ready to jump off and fly from this place. Aqua asked the princess if she would come back to this place later? After all, if she flew too far away. Osiria turned around and said she would fly away and never come back here again. She asked her assistant, had she forgotten how she had been enduring and waiting for this moment all this time? The next moment she jumped out of the window, shouting to Aqua to fly after her. The mermaid shouted back that her mistress was in too much of a hurry and barely had time to create wings behind her. Osiria froze in mid-air and realized that she was actually flying. This way she would be able to fly to anywhere in the world. But in the next instant, the wings dissipated and she flew downwards. Aqua was frightened and created a bubble of water under her mistress so that she landed on it like a pillow. As soon as Osiria landed on it, the bubble burst and she landed on the grass, uninjured. She told Aqua that she was fine, but during the fall she thought she was going to die. The little mermaid cried and began to apologize, explaining that for unknown reasons her strength had suddenly weakened, and that was why her wings had disappeared. The princess told her assistant not to worry and added that it wasn't her fault. It all happened because of her own haste. Aqua hugged the princess, and then they heard someone calling for Osiria and approaching them. People shouted that they heard the princess for sure and there could be no mistake. The frightened girl told Aqua to hide and she disappeared into the pattern on her arm again. Walking towards the princess realized that you jumped out of the window and ran even faster. Osiria's heart began to pound rapidly with fear. She was afraid of what they would do to her after she had made so much noise. They would definitely want to interrogate her, but there was no way she could think of an excuse. Mary grabbed the princess by the shoulders and asked if she was alright if she was hurt. Sir Fidelia stood behind the maid. The princess didn't understand and looked dumbfounded. Why wasn't she angry? Mary cried and Osiria wondered even more. Could they be worried about her and cry over her like that, knowing her for only a couple days? Fidelius asked Mary if the princess had hurt herself. The maid answered them that she was fine, as the princess had fallen on the soft grass. Fidelius said he was glad that the princess was not hurt, but he did not understand how it came to be, and what was she doing alone while in the room. The knight called Pedro the butler and asked him to contact Mr. Meter to come by tomorrow and ask for the windows. The butler continued after his master and said himself that he would call an architect and see if he could do something like a hardware arrangement. Osiria still didn't understand why everyone was looking at her like that. Aqua has always been with her, and she's her only family so her excitement is obvious. But these people are in no way related to her, especially Mary, who was just a child but cried the loudest over what happened. Is it possible to start treating a person so friendly in just a few days? Osiria was sure that this girl had a hidden agenda after all. Fidelius lifted her into his arms and squeezed her shoulder. The princess felt uncomfortable, not just physically. She had the feeling that she absolutely did not want to be here and was standing on a vine with thorns. Fidelius tensed with his shadow but said nothing to the princess. The princess fell asleep in Fidelius' arms or passed out. The young man looked at her sleeping and couldn't understand what she was thinking that she even decided to fall out of the window. Had she really done it on purpose? He didn't want to think about it and assured himself that it had happened by mistake. Even though her mental age is like a child, she is capable of realizing if she is being mistreated. The princess could also have tried to escape or no one had told her until now that it could be dangerous. Fidelius thought the princess needed training and brought her to his bedroom. He thought it would be dangerous for her on the second floor in her room and decided to keep an eye on her to make sure she didn't repeat the escape. He recalled his conversation with Mr. Meter after examining the princess. He had informed him that the princess's condition was the result of abuse. She had probably been subjected to it regularly and for a long time, and there were fresh wounds and signs of beatings on her body. The princess was also underweight, dystrophic and anemic, indicating that she had been poorly or not fed at all. The healer believed that the princess had not been watched for a very long time, but despite this, he saw no obvious and serious illnesses. Fidelius was surprised then and asked, could the princess have been so neglected? Mr. Mater replied that she was hated in the empire because of the curse, and added that the human environment affects the soul. If the princess had been bullied or neglected for a long time, that would explain her current condition. In the end, the healer said that the princess had become like this because of regular abuse. This horrified and saddened Fidelius. 
They had not yet installed a fittings device in the princess's room, and there was no guarantee that the princess would not act the same way again. They were very fortunate that she had stayed fine, but he was afraid to leave her alone. Fidelius thought about how he had often heard it said that he was getting too attached to someone and it didn't suit him at all. Even though he was born into a family of knights who were supposed to be the first to bear their swords if war came, because of his soft nature he made everyone worry and fail to live up to expectations as a future warrior. As a child, from time to time Fidelius would save weak animals from natural selection. All because he just couldn't stand to watch someone kill them. However, all the animals he brought in were thrown away by his father, and in the end he was never able to save any. And then he decided to himself that he would never make the same mistake twice, but he believed that even with the passage of time, old habits don't disappear completely, because he wanted to take care and protect the weak princess. This was not a beast, but a princess of another nation that he might have to kill one day, chopped like a dry log that would break with a slight push. Someone you couldn't look at without pity, someone you couldn't hurt, someone you couldn't look away from. Though his father was not there now, he had the man he had sworn to protect. He laid the princess on the bed, and covered her with a blanket, then took hold of his head, worrying over his own thoughts. He was afraid of becoming attached to the princess and burdening himself with the responsibility of her life and fate. Even if his heart took a certain side and the balance of the scales tipped, if everything was under control, everything would be fine. He tried to act and step in her direction so that he could hold his feelings in his hands with determination. And then, if he received the order, even if in doubt, he would still be able to bear his sword. He could only hope that His Majesty the King would not order him to point the blade in the princess's direction. He shamed himself for thinking and wishing like a little child. Then he wondered if his and the princess paths had collided in a different situation, would he have been able to think only of a good ending? Morning came, and Osiria woke up. She didn't feel very well, she had a headache. She sat up on her bed and found that she was in a room that was unfamiliar to her. The walls here were completely glass and the view overlooked the garden, which was incredibly beautiful. Suddenly someone called out to her, saying your highness she turned at the sound and saw a wrinkled and sleepy Fidelia sitting on the sofa. The girl immediately realized that she had slept in his bed, and he had been forced to sleep on the uncomfortable couch. He asked if she had slept well and if she had any pain anywhere. It made Osiria tense that he was asking her this while he himself slept on the uncomfortable sofa, and his body must be stiff and sore. She thought he must realize now that he would hear no answer. Fidelius got up and flopped down on the edge of the bed. Then he apologized and asked if she had a boo-boo anywhere. This made the girl very embarrassed and Fidelius himself also blushed and looked away, embarrassed to be having such a childish conversation with the princess. He was worried that she might not understand him and didn't know if he had done the right thing. For a moment Osiria doubted her hearing, for could a noble knight speak words like boo-boo? Suddenly, Fidelius abruptly took the girl's hand and hurriedly said that she didn't seem to have any pain, but just in case he would bring Mr. Mater in the evening for an examination, and Mary would soon prepare breakfast. The blush faded from the knight's face, the embarrassment was gone, and he finally introduced himself by his full name, Fidelius Wilhart. He approached the princess and asked her to say his name. She pouted and turned away from him, and then he asked her frustratedly, did she not like him? Or was she afraid of him after all? Then he said he would understand if she had trouble saying his name, and the princess thought about how it seemed he would never stop showering her with questions. She bit her fingernail and decided to answer him so he would finally get off her back. She pronounced his name deliberately wrong, saying Federus instead of Fidelius. The young man's eyes glazed over and he said his name again so she could repeat it better by ear. Osiria did not understand him and then he, taking her hand again, said that his name was not Federus but Fidelius. They found themselves very close to each other and silently looked into each other's eyes, and when they realized this, they abruptly sat back down, embarrassed again. The princess felt his palms for the first time without armor, they were large and warm. Fidelius turned aside and began rubbing his neck nervously, and mouthed his name again. Then Osirius stubbornly began to repeat his name with an R, Fidarius. Fidarius. As if a small child were given to the difficulty of any letter. She wanted to make him angry, but the young man brightened up and thanked her for calling him by his name. His smile was beautiful like a flower that almost died but suddenly slowly bloomed. And for some reason Osiria couldn't take her eyes off him. They left the room, and Fidelius said that he had to leave for the palace soon and asked the princess to wait for him. And as he left he asked her not to go near the windows. The princess thought that it seems that yesterday he was very much frightened because of her fall, and now all eyes will be even more focused on her, because of which it will be easy to catch her trying to escape again. It won't be easy. She wasn't going to sit idly by though. 
When the knight left and she was sure she was alone in the room, she immediately changed her face, taking off her mask of a naive child her gaze became serious. She paced around the room and reasoned that it was likely that the imperial delegation would be traveling back around tomorrow. They would be traveling with the water they had safely obtained, thanks to the exchange. Therefore, it would be fun enough to empty the barrels before they arrived at the emperor's castle. If the water barrels turned out to be dry after they had struggled to bring them back after suffering through over a month of sailing, the princess had no idea what kind of grimace her father would make in such a case. Osiris summoned Aqua and said that Mary would be coming soon so the mermaid should listen to her carefully. She then said that she would be traveling to meet Arena tonight. Aqua asked if the mistress was really talking about the horrible woman who had tormented her. Osiria replied that she was talking about her exactly. About the woman who brought her moldy bread every day and beat her no matter the time or situation. Aqua asked what they would do when they met her. Princess said she didn't know but afterwards she remembered Aqua telling her earlier that the strong devour the weak. Arena had hurt her, and now she was stronger than her so she intended to repay her in kind. Aqua said that Mistress is right, and no matter what the weak people try to do she will still defeat everyone, and Aqua will be her shield and sword and will protect her to the end. She asked the princess not to doubt anything, and if she wanted, Aqua could become a tsunami at any time and swallow all her enemies. Osiria said that since Arena had come with the delegation she should be at the royal palace, which was why they would come to see her before they sailed back to the empire in the morning. The payment for pain should only be revenge, and it ends in death. The princess' thoughts were fierce and bloodthirsty. After talking to Aqua, the princess sat down to eat breakfast. Mary was silent, banging her dishes on the table every now and then and sniffing. These sounds annoyed Osiria. She looked at the maid and saw that she was sniffling because she was crying quietly. The maid asked again if anything was hurting the princess. The girl was very tired of listening to this question all morning. Suddenly, Mary fell to her knees and hugged the princess, apologizing to her for not watching her and not explaining that being close to open windows could be dangerous. She promised she would never leave her again, she would watch over her and take care of her. Crying harder, Mary took the princess's hand and putting her palm to her cheek, asked her not to die. It was a request for the princess's only promise, after which, hearing only silence in reply, Mary said she would never leave her again, and wanted the princess to be by her side as she was now. Osiria was puzzled. So, we look forward to your comments about this story, to not miss new videos. Please subscribe to notifications. Thanks for watching.